Thank you very much. Uh, the topic I chose today, I think I chose without really knowing how far it was going to take me, and I apologize for its shortcomings. But we were actually set up uh, in 1997, the year that the Habitat's directive regulations were implemented in Ireland. Uh, those of us who gathered together uh, in the library of the Central Hotel in Dublin believed at that time that European law was about to give us what national law had failed to do, an effective legal regime that would protect our environment from ill-considered development-driven driven projects and plans and ensure access to redress when this failed. There have been many analyses of what the judgments of the European Court say. There has perhaps been less attention to how effective they've been. Each of the key judgments which we can look at today have arisen only through the complaints of citizens and NGOs, as the only way we can get to the Commission is to bring, to bring them this way. We don't have direct access to the European Courts. Under the current procedures, a complainant's letter is first entered in the pilot database and communicated directly with the member state with the object of seeking a resolution at national level. Ludwig Kramer writes of this new system, with this communication, the environmental complaints seems to die a rather silent death. Indeed, if one looks back at 20 years of the existence of this instrument, the Commission has made a full circle from the guarantee that environmental complaints would be investigated by its services, it has reached the conclusion that complaints, the 208 communication speaks of cases, would immediately be communicated to the member state concerned. The Commission puts it this way, in this respect, the Commission must point out that in accordance with the established case law of the Court of Justice, it enjoys a discretionary power in deciding whether or not to commence infringement proceedings and to refer a case to the Court. The Court has also acknowledged the Commission's power to decide at its own discretion when to commence an action. The treaty uh, itself uh, sets out the procedures, a decision by the Secretary General, a letter of formal notice, failing a satisfactory resolution, a reasoned opinion, increasingly optional, and finally a judgment of the Court. The average time for this process is currently four years. Generally speaking, a member state is then given at least two years more to comply. Where this has not happened, the Commission can begin the process again, seeking daily fines under 260 of the TEFU. If the Commission is satisfied with the subsequent compliance, the new proceedings can be withdrawn. If not, the Court may impose lump or daily fines. Ireland leads the dubious league of those member states being brought before the ECJ to face fines for failure to meet judgments. Ireland has 14 cases, followed by Italy's nine cases and Greece's eight cases. As Andrew Jackson summarizes, Ireland was the worst performer by some distance in terms of meeting its obligations after a breach had been confirmed by the European Court of Justice. Until I began to prepare this presentation, I had no idea of the number of environmental issues that had been covered by ECJ judgments against Ireland, nor did I appreciate the number or commitment of Irish NGOs who were involved both in the complaints procedure or in the pursuit of the requirements of the judgments, which turn out to be the opposite sides of the same coin. They have my thanks for the information they provided, my apologies for any mistakes and the limitations that today's format imposes. The first case that I was going to look at uh, has actually been discussed here already. It's the costs issue. And uh, the, uh, we don't have the ratification of the Aarhus Convention. We only have the European Directive, which has addressed the personal liability for the huge costs that arises under our adversarial legal system, as well as the frightening potential damages for major projects. The European Court noted that in relation to costs, there is no applicable ceiling as to regards the amount that an unsuccessful applicant will have to pay, as there is no legal provision which refers to the fact that procedures will not be prohibitively expensive. In response to this judgment, we had 50B added to our Act, notwithstanding anything contained in the order of the superior courts, proceedings to which this section supply each party, including any notice party, shall bear its own costs. Now, the result of this, I think, has been made clear. We go to court because we hope that if we do win, we can recoup our costs and those who work for us and, and, and take these cases for us will receive some compensation for their time. But uh, that will not be the case in these judgments anymore. 
the only exceptions I think I'd highlight would be that they, there's a very high hurdle that was mentioned earlier. That there are three things. The case must be of public importance, there must be special circumstances, and it must be in the interest of justice. That's very difficult barriers for us to meet. So one of the key results from the judgment in this case was to make it less likely for us to bring judicial reviews, exactly the opposite of what the directive intended and the complainants sought. The other thing I think I could add to this discussion is that we did a survey of other environmental NGOs who belong, as we do, to the European Environmental Bureau and found that the cost of taking cases across Europe, with the exception of the UK and Ireland, was seldom more than 5,000 euro. In the Netherlands, even a lawyer is not necessary. As the EEB Law List member wrote, this type of appeal is considered part of a government re-evaluation of a case that should be made without much cost to the citizens. They have a right to sound decision making and already paying taxes for that. The courts are expected to distill the legal merits of the case on the basis of the arguments made by lay persons with a sufficient interest, like NGOs, and if necessary, make its own research of the facts. That's a long way from where we stand in Ireland. The other case that I was looking at initially, C18305, conditions precedent and default permissions, has also been dealt with to a degree today. The, the, the problem was that uh, Ireland was making decisions without having all the information in front of them. But despite this judgment and the subsequent issues of Circular Letter 108 by the Department of the Environment, permissions continue to be issued on this basis. Anbord Planola, on the 16th of September 2009, gave permission to Shannon Explosives Limited for an explosives factory on the SAC-designated Shannon Estuary, while leaving major issues relating to the site excavation, including design, ecology, and landscaping, to be resolved by post-consent provisions of information by the developer and agreement by Clare County Council, which we obviously had no standing in. Antoshka requested the EU Commission to take direct action to seek the quashing of that order since, they pointed out, since the ECJ judgment of 17 July 2009 confirmed that Ireland has not put in place the direct procedural and substantive measures required under Article 10A of the revised EIA directive to review consent decisions in Ireland at a reasonable cost. Nothing happened. I don't think any response was received on that from the Commission. Antoshka itself, whoops, we'll go back, we'll get there. Antoshka itself took dramatic legal action in 2010 in a case of default permission. The planning authority had not made a decision and the requested planning permission on time, so the developer sought default permission and won his case both in the High Court and the Supreme Court. Before the Supreme Court order was perfected, Antoshka applied to the court on the grounds that it had been wrongly excluded from the case and that section, and that, <coughs> excuse me, and that Section 34, which allowed default permission, was contrary to EU law. The Supreme Court agreed to stay its ruling until the matter was heard in the High Court, and Antashka was given standing in the case. As Ivan Scannell comments, this decision goes very far in ensuring respect for EU law. The retention culture has also been mentioned today. Antashka, however, has provided the Commission with a number of cases where considerations never subjected to a prior EIA were approved retrospectively. Ian Lumley, Antashka's heritage officer who pursued these cases, is particularly frustrated by the board's ruling that cited above for the Shannon's explosive factory at Kildysert County, Clare. On 31st January 2003, the board had refused permission on the grounds of the lack of assessment of the impact of extraction and bringing film materials to the site in order to raise the level of the factory as objectors had provided photographs of the flooded site. Now this isn't the flooded site, but it's a similar kind of situation. The developer then got planning permission for a quarry on the site under section 261 of the Planning Development Act 2000 from Clare County Council on the basis that it was a continually operating pre-1964 site in spite of documentation provided by the Silesian Order and other residents that there never been a quarry on this site. And Board Planola then accepted the registered quarry as meeting its requirements for regulation of the extractive material in the 203 ruling and granted permission. Even in cases in Kildare, Cavan and Wicklow where Antashka has been successful in overturning local authority decisions to grant permission for quarries, 
There has been no response from the relevant councils as to what action has been taken to close and remediate the unauthorized sites. The complaint system was nowhere more amply illustrated than in the waste judgment against Ireland. The Commission began its case based on three complaints. The dumping of construction and demolition waste on wetlands in Limerick, the storage and land spreading of organic waste in County Cork, and the unauthorised storage of waste in County Wicklow, Wexford. As the case proceeded, five more complaints were received from Carlow, Dublin, Tremor, Kilbarry from Fye, County Waterford and Donegal. Three more complaints came in from Louth, Wicklow and Waterford. The Commission was thus able to argue successfully that there was a general and persistent breach of EU law based on the 11 complainants, all unbeknownst to each other. But what did these cases achieve? The Commission cites a long list of licensing, closer cooperation, funding, policies, so on. Certainly, the judgment sorted 11 sites. It also ended a vast and lucrative criminal world of cross-border waste operators. But our organization's complaints about the entirely unregulated and unlicensed storage of toxic waste from the Irish Steel ISPAT operations at Holbolan Island, County Cork, has gone nowhere in more than two years. All we're looking for is an environmental impact assessment. To add insult to injury, we've just been told that one of the 209 access to the environment information requests which we made depends on the Supreme Court hearing a parallel request which has been scheduled now for late 2013. So we're told we can expect a ruling on the information in 2014. The lessons of the Curtistown landfill, where the EPA is now forced to pursue the directors individually, as you've been hearing, uh, would suggest that the closer cooperation between local authorities, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the Director of Public Prosecutions may not have been entirely realized. And we pay the huge costs. A recently released EPA report suggested remediation at Curtistown will cost the state up to 30 million. More than six million has reportedly been spent in an emergency response to recent fires. Hoboken cost 42 million by 2008 when all work was stopped. The bill for repatriating waste and remediating sites across the border, where our waste was illegally dumped between 2002 and 2004, is estimated to be 36 million. Certainly, the Curtistown County Kildare resident who wrote into the EPA would not be impressed with a complaint system the Commission thinks has been established as a result of C49401. Quote, unless you've had to endure the arduous, lengthy, irritating and annoying process which we have had to endure for almost five years, you will never know the pain of dealing with an agency like the EPA, which lacks the basic courtesy of replying to a registered letter which was written by my 73-year-old mother in the early hours of a November night in 2009 because she could not sleep with the pungent, noxious odors. Six complaints from Ireland led to the judgment in the Birds case of 13 December 2007. Many organizations have actively and strenuously sought to have elements of the Birds judgment implemented. Birdwatch Ireland, the Golden Eagle Trust, and Tashka and ourselves amongst others, each with different goals and each working independently. From the judgment early in 2008, fresh from the judgment early in 2008, the Golden Eagle Trust and the Irish Raptor Study Group met National Parks and Wildlife, submitting an action plan points for the raptors. They focused on Ireland's failure to curb the indiscriminate and reckless use of poison and the lack of a protocol for systematic post-mortem examinations, toxicology analysis, and records of dead birds. Of the 77 birds introduced since 2007, 15 had died, nine of them confirmed as poisoned. 18 months later, the Golden Eagle Trust's patient was exhausted and they submitted a new infringement complaint to the EU. Finally, perhaps mainly due to public, national and international outcries, in October 2010 a ban was announced on alpha chlorolos, which was previously registered and commonly used to kill crows and foxes, and on the use of meat baits. The Golden Eagle Trust recently learned that alpha chloros had actually been placed on the restricted list by the Department of Agriculture in 2008, but no one had told no one. Birdwatch maintained frequent contact with the Commission and with the NPWS and the Department of Environment to progress delivering the components of the ECJ ruling, particularly the missing SPAs. 
they feel that large chunks of the judgment still have not been addressed. Friends worked on the Hen Harrier, an issue that came into play because of our uh, interest in, in, in forestry. This became topical through a coordinated campaign by the farming community against the designations, which began in 2002. You see here the breeding atlas of the location of the Hen Harrier, 1968-1970. At the hearing of this case in 6 July 2006, Ireland stated that studies had been carried out on six of the nine above mentioned species included in Annex 1, as well as on the Dunlin, a regularly occurring migratory species. The completion of that work henceforward allows for the identification of sites which may be classified as SPAs for the conservation of the red-throated diver, the hen harrier, the merlin, the golden plover, and the Dunlin. This is a reduction, which you can see, by 1997 to 200 of the hen harrier's extent. Then, this was the 202 areas that were going to be designated for SPAs. But in spite of telling the commission at the oral hearing that they were looking at more areas for designation, when the Doyle resumed after the summer break, Dick Roach, then Minister for the Environment, told the House on 29 November 2006 that since the 2003 announcement of the original designations of the SBA for protection of the hen harrier, my department has thoroughly reviewed the research and information on the hen harrier, including the results of a second national survey in 2005. Based on this work, a significant consolidation in relation to the number and extent of hen harrier SPAs is now envisioned. And this was the consolidation. It meant that the nine areas identified in 2003 were cut to six areas, and the total hectares to be protected fell from 287,000 hectares to 169,000 hectares. The Kilworths and the Nagels lost all protection, and the Ballyhoras were also excluded from the SBA designation. This was despite the fact that the Ballyhoras had seen the most improved Harrier numbers since 2000. The situation today remains that there has been no further announcement of the designations promised Europe in 2006. I'm going to repeat a slide that you saw earlier of the Dingle Peninsula in, in looking at a number of ways in which 6606, the countryside judgment, <coughs> occurred. You can see the, the field patterns here, and you can see what transpired later on. We're now actually in the final endgame over this case, that we have failed to protect the environmental sensitivity of geographical areas by not paying particular attention to landscapes of historical, cultural, or archaeological significance. <coughs> On the 16th of February, the Commission issued a press release announcing, Environment Commission seeks fines against Ireland for not adopting legislation to protect the countryside. In March of 2010, the Commission sent Ireland its first written warning. In May of 2010, the Department wrote to selected NGOs an admirable initiative, I think without precedent, seeking advice and outlining their initial ideas. Again, many organizations had concerns, and Phi concentrated on the destruction of archaeological monuments, as this tied into work on a blatant case in North Cork. The loss of our archaeology has been staggering. A 2000 publication by the Heritage Council of seven study areas uh, 2.2 percent of the land area of the Republic found that 34 percent of the monuments known to exist in the study area had been destroyed in the previous quarter century, and a further 10 percent could not be found. The destruction rate was estimated at 10 percent of the monuments per decade. In 2006, Chagas, the farm advisory body, called the coming decade a high-risk period for Ireland's archaeological heritage. Chagas predicted that the reduction in farm numbers, together with the enlargement of farms to the scale necessary to maintain international competitiveness, will result in the long-standing familiar associations with archaeological sites becoming significantly eroded. Yet there had never been a successful prosecution of landowners for the destruction of a monument. In fact, under the National Monuments Amendment Act 204, only the failure to notify of the intention to perform works on these sites was an offense. Legal opinions prepared for us show that unless land landowners were notified, a plea of mens rea, no knowledge or intent to commit offense, would be likely to succeed. 
We lobbied extensively for notification to landowners, as is done to alert farmers to the designations of special areas of conservation or spe special protection areas. And it would not be expensive. As Minister for Finance Brian Lenehan changed the law in 2008 to allow government departments to make searches for landowners free. The completion of the electronic register of all landowners has made it what the land registry calls an overnight job to provide the names and addresses of all the landowners with their monuments on their land. Yet the department's National Monuments Advisory Committee refused to add the notification to the proposed new, mo new monuments legislation. And we wait to see if this will be required by the Commission to satisfy this judgment. That same judgment also raises the issue of the bizarre uh, Irish agricultural situation. Approximately two-thirds of Ireland's fish farms are located in Natura 2000 sites, the sensitive estuaries into which our major rivers exit with their protected species. Of these two-thirds, a further two-thirds are pending renewal or a new license. At a conservative estimate, half of Ireland's aquaculture lacks a valid license and therefore has not been subject to any environmental assessment, something clearly laid out in EU law. The issue was first raised by the Commission in 2001. It came to judgment on 20 November 2008 and has now been notified to Ireland as subject of a new application to the courts. The initial application to the ECJ was brought on 6 February 2006. Four months later, on 4 April 2006, Ireland enacted the Sea Fisheries and Maritime Jurisdiction Act 2006. Section 19A gave operators the right to continue to operate without license if they had simply applied for a renewal. It was under this legislation that the mussel dredgers operated in Loch Swilly SPA, in spite of Coast Watchers' extraordinary efforts over three years to prevent this ongoing ecological disaster. Finally, in November 2010, Coastwatch issued a week's warning notice to the minister that if he did not comply with the four months time limit to determine licenses under section 13 of the Fisheries Amendment Act 1999, they would bring proceedings. The minister's astonishing reply was that he was under no obligation to do so because section 13 had never been commenced. Section one of the 1996 Act requires that each section be commenced. Further legal advice confirmed that neither sections 11 or 13 had commenced, but the opinion also revealed that section 19A of the Sea Fisheries and Maritime Jurisdiction Act 2006, under which is noted some half of aquaculture industry is operating, has also not been commenced. It was because the mussel dredgers in Loch Swilly drew their authorization from section 19A that a court granted an injunction to prevent local fishermen from interfering in the dredging. The fishermen lost the case and costs were awarded against them, bringing them this week before the bankruptcy court. The legal opinion which revealed this was sought by Coastwatch and was given by John Wilde Crosby on 28 February 2011 at the launch of their survey in the offices of the EU Commission. To make the situation more legally sensitive, the fishermen in Loch Swilly, who felt hard done by, challenged 19A on the grounds that it was unconstitutional, as that it did not balance the rights of the parties. Justice de Valeur ruled that section 19A was in fact constitutional, which it might have been if sections 11 and 13 of the Act, which protected other users, had been commenced. At the time of writing, it's unclear what the consequences will be of this situation. Karen Dubsky, who I know is here today to answer any questions, wrote, it means that in areas where the aquaculture activity is damaging to the environment, it should not have continued, and the loss, even in Natura 2000 sites, must now be addressed and rest restoration planned. The same judgment dealt with fencing, the non-enforcement of, rather than the non-commencement of Irish legislation. Long the subject of complaints from Keep Ireland Open, <coughs> the Planning and Development Regulations 201 require planning permission for the permanent fencing of lands habitually open to the public for recreational purposes or as means of access to the seashore, mountain, lakeshore, riverbank, or other places of natural beauty or recreational utility. Yet Upland's fencing over the last two years has increased dramatically, particularly in mountainous, traditionally unenclosed land in counties like Donegal. Yet the Donegal Local Authority has no records of any planning applications in the last five years. The cause of the explosion of fencing is the need for more spread lands for the additional slurry now collected through the new facilities provided under the Farm Modernization Scheme, combined with the nitrates regulations. 
Without these additional land, farmers risk exceeding the limits under the nitrates regulations for nutrient levels on their existing spread lands. Afraid that these remote parcels of land were not being utilized, but were simply what is called map acres, the department required permanent fencing, even refusing to allow electric fencing, and even in the successor to reps where the fencing is paid for by the state. The department did not make recipients of the grants aware of the planning regulations and the farmers fenced the land. To date, the department has refused to address the issue and a complaint has been made to the Secretary General of the European Commission. Perhaps worst of all is the situation that has evolved with our peatlands. As long ago as 21 September 1999, the court ruled that Ireland has not denied that no project for the extraction of peat covered by point 2A of Annex 2 to the directive has been the subject of an impact assessment, although small-scale peat extraction has been mechanized, industrialized, and considerably intensified, resulting in the unremitting loss of areas of bog of nature conservation. Ireland's 2007 Article 17 report to the European Commission on the Habitats Directive recorded a decrease of 36% in active raised bogs from 1994 to 2005. Ireland's fourth national report to the Convention on Biological Diversity, released on 14 May 2010, estimated that there has been a 99% loss of the original area of actively growing bog, and one-third of the remaining 1% has been lost in the last 10 years, since Phi first met in the Central Hotel. There are two distinct problems. The destruction of designated raised bogs in the last 10 years without the application for a permit that would trigger assessment and the industrial scale extraction in the Midlands bogs without EIA. By 2003, the Commission's patience was exhausted. Then Environmental Commissioner Margaret Wallstrom said, the European Court of Justice ruled on this case over three years ago and it's essential that Ireland now come into line with the legal provisions on environmental impact assessment. The Irish government have recently informed me of their intention to comply fully with the directive. Article 228 proceedings for fines were taken on July of 2003. The Commission sought a daily fine of €21,600 and stated that although Ireland has taken some measures in an effort to execute the judgment, they remain inadequate in theory and have not been implemented in practice. One of the approaches which an internal mail showed they would consider and if feasibly progress was an assessment of the scope for further influencing the Commission to rethink its proposed reference to the ECJ. This would include immediate preparations of a strong briefing note for the McCreevy Cabinet. On December 1st, 2005, the President of the Court ordered that the case be removed from the register. No EIAs have been required and the derogations for raised bog cutting have continued. The hiatus did not last long. A new pilot complaint was received in 2008 that an internal Department of the Environment memo records was, to some degree, a revisiting of the case. The Minister for the Environment defended Ireland in the Doyle on November 2010. I understand there have been a number of cases in which my department, the EPA, or a planning authority has determined that an EIA for peat extraction is required. In fact, only one has ever been undertaken, and that only because the National Parks and Wildlife Service wished to sell a bog no longer needed for turf cutters relocation to a horticultural company, a development ultimately refused by Anne Board Planola after an appeal from Antashka. Part of the promise by Ireland in 2005 had been that 75 raised bogs and 73 blanket bogs would be designated as natural heritage areas and given the status of special areas of conservation. An internal memo shows that even within the department there was confusion. What I have found is Paul Connolly's note to Christina Lachlan with the wording, quote, outlining the positive benefits for the protection of peatlands that will ensue from such NHA designations, unquote. Is that a full statement of what Cashman was suggesting? Or is there any more detail anywhere? I don't propose to ring Cashman, only to give him another opportunity to squeeze more blood out. Indeed, the program for government has now promised that we will allow an exemption for turf cutting on 75 natural heritage area sites subject to the introduction of agreed national code. This is a photograph of the briefing for the minister that I think has been mentioned already today, which came on the internet on Monday. And when you come into your turf cutting, for some reason or other, they have not been clear about what they think the actual issues are. 
We also wonder how the Irish authorities can claim that NHAs have the same status as SACs and SPAs, particularly <clears throat> as NHAs do not have SAC, SPA notifiable actions. The list which inform a landowner of the activities which are considered to require permission from the minister. A letter from the Minister of the Environment, Eamon O'Queeve, in February 11 to local TDs appears to suggest that those who refuse compensation to date should not be asked to cease cutting, said to be 500 of the 700 cutters. In spite of dramatic underspending under the relevant axis, the Department of Agriculture has sa is said to be refusing to make funds available on the grounds that turf cutting is mining not agriculture. Even if a robust compensation program was put in place, there is nothing clear-cut about the future of the government's program. Fai is of the view that the polluter pays principle should apply here, in line with Ireland's obligations under the Environmental Liability Directive. Andrew Jackson writes, surely ceasing an unlawful activity many years after it should have stopped should not attract compensation. Indeed, under the Environmental Liability Directive, turf contractors who have caused significant damage to protected bogs are in fact required to remediate the damage they have caused. The principal obstacle that we have encountered is a flat refusal by the Parks and Wildlife Service to accept that peat extraction must be assessed if it cannot be excluded on the basis of objective scientific information that it will have a significant effect on a site, either individually or in combination with other plans or projects. It is their indefensible position that negative impact must be shown before the requirements are triggered. Remember Margaret Wallstrom's 203 observation that measures taken remain inadequate in theory and have not been implemented in practice? Let us look at the new Minister for the Environment's reply to a written parliamentary question from Independent Dublin South Deputy Maureen O'Sullivan on the 22 March 2011. My department is currently reviewing certain aspects of planning regulations relevant to the application of the Environmental Impact Assessment Directive, both in the context of Ireland's proposals to address the findings of the European Court of Justice case on on-farm developments, as well as broader application of environmental impact assessments for peat extraction. I note the continuing concern expressed in successive questions by the Deputy in respect of environmental impact assessment of peat extractions. As part of the above mentioned review, my department is preparing new regulations which will, inter alia, address peat extraction and EIA. These will be submitted to the Oireachtas for approval by positive resolution in the near future. Indeed, while the issue has now become a formal warning letter, more daily fines, it is coming perilously close to the first use of interim measures by the Commission, injunctive relief, to protect a habitat if the non-compliance on raised bogs considers, continues this year. That's a shot of the same bogs with golden plover above them looking for their vanished habitat. In 2005, the Commission declared that the complaints were the most serious, the most serious complaints were those infringements that undermine the foundation of the rule of law. In 2008, they gave us a further priority respect for court judgments declaring the existence of infringements. There have obviously been serious advances in the environmental protection after rulings of the European Court in waste, wastewater treatment, improved drinking water, and even in incessment. But the failure to move swiftly and directly to address European Court judgments, indeed in cases deliberately to frustrate them, can only undermine the authority of the European Court of Justice and make it less likely that the original hopes of groups like ours for European law will be achieved. Thank you very much.